Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Two of the four Americans kidnapped in Mexico are found dead and the other two are still alive. The FBI and Mexican authorities have made an arrest. Fox's Tucker Carlson releases some of the 41,000 hours of the January 6 footage yet to be seen by the public. What's the significance and how are officials reacting? President Biden proposes to raise taxes on the wealthy to fund Medicare, how the White House frames it, and why Republicans say they won't let Biden's plan see the light of day. Democrats and Republicans ramp up their calls to ban TikTok as the Chinese Communist Party warns the U.S. to pump the brakes on its probes into the regime. And Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin makes an unannounced stop in Baghdad, Iraq. Find out why he was there and who he spoke with. We have more updates on the four Americans kidnapped by gunmen in Mexico. Two of the Americans have been found dead, and one of the two survivors is severely injured. All four were reportedly discovered in a medical clinic in the border city of Matamoros, where the kidnapping took place. Officials identified the four Americans. Shaid Woodward and Zindel Brown were found dead. Latavia Washington McGee was found alive and uninjured, and Eric Williams was found suffering from a bullet wound to the leg. The two survivors are now back in the U.S. and receiving treatment at a Texas hospital. Investigators say they believe a Mexican cartel mistook the Americans for Haitian drug smugglers and that the four victims have no concern in criminal history. Meanwhile, the investigation and search for those responsible is ongoing. One person has been detained so far. The U.S. has issued a travel advisory for the region, adding the Mexican state to the list of level four do-not-travel areas. And the world knows a little bit more, as of last night, about the events at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Fox News host Tucker Carlson aired segments from the unreleased footage after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy gave him access, saying the footage belongs to the American people. The footage shows people gathering in what looks to be a fairly orderly fashion, which Carlson says suggests the protest was not an insurrection. It also shows Jacob Chansley, famous for his horned furry hat, inside the Capitol. Carlson says it shows police didn't stop and even helped Chansley, who is now serving three and a half years in jail for his actions that day. An internal memo from the Capitol Police chief says police were outnumbered and focusing on de-escalation tactics. Carlson also shows footage that he says shows Capitol Police officer Brian Sicknick looking healthy at a time when he reportedly was injured. Sicknick died of natural causes a day after the breach, according to Washington's chief medical examiner. The release of the footage drawing controversy. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell saying he thought it was a mistake to allow Carlson to dis- depict the January 6 events as he did. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre saying January 6 was the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. And former President Trump saying a whole new and completely opposite picture has now been indelibly pla- painted and let the January 6 prisoners go. And now let's turn to a man who has followed and reported extensively on the events of January 6th. Darren Beatty is the founder and editor of Revolver News, and I spoke with him earlier today. Darren Beatty, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. Now, Tucker Carlson showed some of the newly available footage from the January 6th Capitol breach yesterday. You've been following J6 in depth. What's your response to what was released so far? Well, I think it's pretty remarkable footage, and Tucker handled it very well. Uh, I think what's important to note is that the footage that he presented touched upon three of the main pillars of the Fed's surrection lie, that is to say the media's lies about January 6th. So first he showed footage reinforcing what a lot of us No, frankly, which is that everyone wasn't there vandalizing. It was actually very few people engaged in vandalism. So that's one segment of it. There's another segment um, that involves footage of an officer called Brian Sicknick, 
He was a Capitol Police officer who tragically died shortly after January 6. But the circumstances surrounding his death served as the first major lie, kind of a prelude to the bigger Fedsurrection lie. Originally, the media was reporting his death as a murder, that he was murdered by the rabid MAGA mob who bludgeoned him to death with a fire extinguisher. Um, in fact, the first piece that Revolver.News, my news organization, ever published on January 6th was about Brian Signick. The title was MAGA Blood Libel, pointing out that it is indeed a blood libel for the media to blame Sicknick's death on the mob because he was not bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. They then moved on to the story. New York Times said, well, maybe he wasn't bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher, but he was... Uh, he died as a complication resulting from bear spray. The crowd bear sprayed him. Well, Revolver did an extensive analysis, comparative image analysis that showed, no, he was not sprayed with bear spray in the manner that New York Times initially reported. The Times caught in another lie. So finally, reluctantly, but very quietly, they acknowledged, okay, Officer Sicknick died of natural causes. So there's that element that Tucker covered very well. And then there's the third element, which is the most explosive and provocative, and it's the element for which I'm probably best known and Revolver News is probably best known, and that is the Fed element, the Fed surrection element. And Tucker presents a video clip of Ray Epps that depicts Epps in behavior that contradicts his stated testimony to the January 6th committee. And the broader context of this is that Ray Epps, which I imagine your viewers have heard of him, he is the most infamous alleged provocateur in the whole January 6th Fed surrection. He's the only person caught on camera as early as January 5th telling people to go into the Capitol. I'm probably going to get arrested for this, but we need to go into the Capitol. Well, he wasn't arrested. <laughs> he, he was there on January 6th everywhere. He was a veritable Where's Waldo directing people to the Capitol. He was pre-positioned right at that initial breach site, whispering into people's ear seconds before the breach took place. He texted his nephew acknowledging that he, quote unquote, orchestrated the protest on the Capitol. His behavior was so egregious that he was named one of the top 20 people, one of the first 20 people on the FBI's own most wanted list pertaining to January 6th. Then all of a sudden, when Revolver News started talking about federal involvement, Ray Epps curiously disappeared from the FBI's most wanted list. And all of a sudden, this guy, who was also the former head of the Arizona chapter of the Oath Keepers, the most demonized and prosecuted militia group associated with January 6th, all of a sudden, this perfect poster boy for the insurrection became the darling of the regime. January 6 witch hunters like Adam Kinsinger, who's never seen a Trump supporter, he doesn't want rotting in prison for less than 50 years, becomes Ray Epps' unlikely defender. In fact, that's the most remarkable thing about the committee's interrogation of Epps with the transcript released. It reveals that Adam Kinsinger bends over backwards to offer the most implausibly charitable interpretation of lie after lie after lie that Ray Epps tells. He's more of an advocate for Epps than Epps' own lawyer, who incidentally is a nine-year veteran of the Phoenix field office of the FBI. And so I think Tucker treating that piece of footage about Ray Epps was very, um, very appropriate in the sense of giving a kind of comprehensive uh, look at all of the lies pertaining to January 6th. You, you've said that you hope the footage can help show enough detail to crack open and make clear what happened that day. What else are you hoping to see? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm hoping in that 40,000 plus hours, we get some really good high res footage of scaffold commander and the two or three other people who I think um, simply to identify them will elevate the narrative and become, you know, the biggest scandal in American history. So um, 
that's, I think, the best case scenario for what could happen. There's a lot of footage. It can take a long time, you know, finding, you know, one clean shot in 40,000 hours. That's, you know, it's, it's not easy to do, assuming that clean shot is even in there. You know, maybe it's not in there and maybe some people took it out before they even gave the footage to, you know, Tucker's people. I don't know. But that would be the best case scenario for me is that in this process, we get um, some really good footage that ultimately leads to the positive identification of some of these um, question marks, some of these mysteries that continue to to haunt uh, the Fed surrection uh, story. Wow. Thank you so much. Darren Beatty, founder and editor at Revolver News. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. And next, President Biden seeks a contrast with Republicans by pushing a new plan today to fund Medicare. The method? Raising taxes on wealthy Americans. NTD's Iris Tao has more from the White House. President Biden is proposing to raise taxes on Americans making more than $400,000 a year to fund Medicare. That's after he said last week. I want to make it clear. I'm going to raise some taxes. Writing in a Tuesday op-ed in the New York Times, Biden says his plan will, quote, make the Medicare trust fund solvent beyond 2050 without cutting a penny in benefits. And the White House on Tuesday hailing the president's plan, saying it'll fund Medicare for another generation and... The president would not raise taxes on anyone making less than $400,000. We're going to make sure that rich pay their fair share. The Biden's measure will most likely get blocked in the House, where Republicans are in control and opposing any tax hikes. Here's a Senate Minority Leader on Tuesday saying Americans should be thankful that Republicans won't let the measure go through. Massive tax increases, more spending, all of which the American people can thank the Republican House for, will not see the light of day. Republicans have also denied accusations by the Biden administration that they're trying to cut Medicare, saying all they want is to cut spending without hurting Medicare or Social Security. While amid debates over the debt ceiling, President Biden will unveil his full budget plan this Thursday and is expected to talk more about his plan to make wealthy Americans pay more in taxes to fund Medicare. Reporting from the White House, Aris Tao, NTD News. The Federal Reserve will likely raise interest rates more than previously expected. Fed Chair Jerome Powell hinted at this today during his testimony before a Senate committee. It could be the case if data continues to point to a robust economy and persistently high inflation. The latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be, to be higher than previously anticipated. Powell also says the process of getting inflation back down to 2 percent has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. Senators responded with a broad set of questions, and many asked whether the Fed was dealing with inflation correctly. Some wanted to know if the Fed can fight inflation without hurting the economic growth and the job market. But it seems like Powell is hinting that higher unemployment is expected. Calls to ban TikTok are intensifying and surpassing party lines. On Capitol Hill today, two lawmakers introduced a bill to do just that. This as China warns the U.S. to pump the brakes. Here's NTD's Melina Wisecup with the details. Democrat Senator Mark Warner and GOP Whip John Thune stood alongside a bipartisan group of senators today to uh, unveil a bill that would allow the Commerce Department to take action against tech giants that are ran by nations deemed as foreign adversaries. Now, this includes China. One goal with this bill is to lay the groundwork to implement a national ban on the popular social media app TikTok. The Chinese Communist Party has proven over the last few years that is willing to lie about just about everything. That likely won't end with TikTok. Canada's taken this action, the EU's taken this action, India banned TikTok years ago. In Warner's comments stand out as a Democrat, he's willing to directly say that former President Trump was right to implement policy regarding TikTok because of the national security threat that it poses. And senators today were eager to explain why this bill is broader because they say TikTok is not the only tech platform ran by countries overseas that's concerning. As they've 
uh, Senator Romney was just saying, exported their own surveillance state uh, in, in China and around the world. This is doing damage to humanity. And one major goal with this bill is to allow the government the ability to make the case to TikTok users as for why this app is a national security threat. And in a sense, this is the only enforcement mechanism that this bill has because senators clarified that it would not allow the government to go after individual users um, that are using TikTok. And he also, and Senator Warner also says that he hopes that American tech platforms can come in and fill that gap to help the TikTok users transition. And the House Foreign Affairs Committee already advanced a similar bill showing that this is a priority for lawmakers in both chambers of Congress. While it is easily expected to pass the Republican-led House, its fate here in the Senate is less clear. Senate Leader Chuck Schumer today was asked about it, saying he has not yet looked at this piece of legislation. And this comes as the CCP is now warning the U.S. to back off. If the U.S. does not hit the brakes, but continues to speed down the wrong path, no amount of guardrails can prevent derailing, and there will surely be conflicts and confrontation. And today I asked those senators who are pushing for that TikTok bill their direct response to the CCP's quote here. Here's what they told me. $500 billion a year of intellectual property theft. Entities called the Confucius Institutes at many universities that were used to prey upon Chinese exchange students. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin made an unannounced trip to Iraq today. There he met with the Iraqi Prime Minister and discussed security in the region. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin started his trip to the Middle East on Sunday. He flew from Joint Base Andrews, Maryland to Jordan, where he met with U.S. troops. While there, he also met with Jordan's King, Abdullah. According to Jordanian officials, Abdullah blamed Iran for a drug war along its border with Syria, and he asked Austin for assistance. Austin reaffirmed the United States' commitment to Jordan's security, and he thanked Abdullah for his leadership. And then on Tuesday, Austin made an unannounced stop in Baghdad, Iraq, where he once commanded as a four-star general. And his trip there came just days before the 20-year anniversary of the beginning of the Iraq War. He met with Iraqi Prime Minister al-Sudani and Iraqi Defense Minister al-Abbasi, and he spoke to the press afterward. We're deeply committed to ensuring that the Iraqi people can live in peace and dignity, with safety and security, and with e economic opportunity for all. Austin reaffirmed America's commitment to security in the region, which comes as Iran has widely expanded its influence in Iraq over the past 20 years. Now, looking forward, U.S. forces are, are ready to remain in Iraq at the invitation of the government of Iraq. Now, these forces are operating in a non-combat advise, assist, and enable role to support the Iraqi-led fight against terrorism. He said they are focused on defeating the terrorist group Daesh, also known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. But military action alone won't ensure the enduring defeat of Daesh. So let me recognize the Iraqi government's ongoing repatriations of Iraqi citizens from northeast Syria. Currently, tens of thousands of Syrians and Iraqis are living in tents at the al Hal refugee camp in northeast Syria. And in the past few weeks, Iraq has brought over 500 women and children from the camp back to Iraq. Secretary Austin also met with the president of the Kurdistan region, Netravan Barzani, in northern Iraq. Austin said the Kurdish military, or Peshmerga, has made huge strides in their counterterrorism capabilities. Austin's Middle East tour will also include stops in Egypt and Israel. Jason Perry, NTD News. Coming up, a passionate speech on the accomplishments of Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis delivers this year's State of the State address. And in the NFL, Packers star Aaron Rodgers has yet to say whether he's playing next season. But that hasn't prevented one team from reportedly talking with him. We'll have that and more coming up. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, 
and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Miss NTD, the first NTD Global Chinese Beauty Pageant. Miss NTD, let's make history together. Turning our attention to Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis delivered his State of the State address today. In it, he summarized Florida's achievements and also outlined some goals for the future. In his State of the State address, Governor Ron DeSantis called Florida the number one state in the United States. He said Florida ranks number one in economic growth among large states, has the lowest per capita state tax, and ranks number one in the nation for education freedom. We defied the experts. We bucked the elites. We ignored the chatter. We did it our way, the Florida way. And the result is that we are the number one destination for our fellow Americans who are looking for a better life. Other achievements that DeSantis touted include banning vaccine mandates and vaccine passports, protecting parental rights, supporting law enforcement, and cutting taxes. He also named a major threat that the nation faces. The Chinese Communist Party represents the greatest economic, strategic, and security threat that our country faces. We in Florida have long recognized this and have taken action, such as by banning the CCP's Confucius Institutes at our state colleges and universities. DeSantis then went on to list plans for the future, saying Florida needs to get ahead of population expansion in the state by accelerating infrastructure projects. He also expressed support for constitutional carry and legal reforms. While our economy has consistently outperformed the nation as a whole, Florida's lawsuit-happy legal climate is still holding us back. The legal system should be centered on achieving justice, not lining the pockets of lawyers. The governor concluded his speech by saying that Florida needs to remain number one in the nation. We can ensure Florida remains number one. Don't worry about the chattering class. Ignore all the background noise. Keep the compass set to true north. We will stand strong. We will hold the line. We won't back down. The State of the State address came at the outset of a 60-day legislative session for Florida lawmakers. DeSantis said the session will present many opportunities for more accomplishments. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Over to the West Coast, Governor Gavin Newsom said California will not do business with Walgreens after it said it will not dispense abortion pills in certain states. The pharmacy company cited legal issues for its decision. In a tweet on Monday, Newsom said California won't be doing business with Walgreens or any company that cowers to the extremists and put women's lives at risk. This comes days after the pharmacy chain said it would not dispense abortion pills in some Republican-dominated states. A spokesperson for the governor said all relationships between Walgreens and the state were now under review but declined to detail how business ties might change. During the third annual March for Life rally at the state capitol in Sacramento on Monday, attendees criticized Newsom's tweet. So passionately pro-abortion is Gavin Newsom. So passionate is he about the dismemberment and the poisoning of babies made in the image of God that he is actually willing to sever the relationship between the state of California and Walgreens the truth is, Walgreens is already shutting down across the state because of his failed leadership. He doesn't want to talk about that. Walgreens said last week it would not dispense abortion pills in 20 states, where Republican attorneys general have warned it risks breaking the law if it distributed the pills. Abortion remains legal in some of these states. In a statement issued later on Monday to clarify its position, Walgreens said it planned to dispense an abortion pill known as mifepristone in any jurisdiction where it is legally allowed to do so. 
The company said, once we are certified by the FDA, we will dispense this medication consistent with federal and state laws. Since February, protesters have popped up in front of Walgreens stores to speak out against the pharmacy dispensing abortion pills. For decades, we have been told that if women do their own abortions at home, that they will die and that they are dangerous. Now, this corporation's Walgreens is trying to make a profit off of that very thing. 28 pregnant women have already died, as well as millions of children because of these drugs. And we must let them know that we will not let them profit off of this killing. Back in January, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration allowed retail pharmacies to sell mifepristone including by mail, provided they were certified under special safety rules for the drug. Now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. The Green Bay Packers and quarterback Aaron Rodgers have had conversations with the New York Jets this week regarding a possible trade, according to multiple sources. Now, it was previously reported that the Jets have interest in acquiring the four-time NFL MVP. But for Rodgers to actually talk with the Jets while under contract with the Packers would mean Green Bay had to give permission. Three years ago, Green Bay traded up in the first round of the draft to select quarterback Jordan Love, who would presumably become their quarterback of the future. But Love has waited behind Rodgers ever since while watching him win two MVP awards. There are still many unknowns though, as the 39-year-old Rodgers still hasn't said whether he plans to play this season. If he does, his contract calls for a whopping $59.5 million salary for 2023. For perspective, the highest salary last year was a $61 million paid to Matt Stafford. Yet because of the way his contract is structured, Green Bay's payroll would actually increase by nearly $10 million should they trade him. The Jets, meanwhile, had a strong defense last season, but struggled offensively in losing their final six games. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, the NBA has eight games on tap, featuring one with the suddenly hot New York Knicks, who've won nine straight games, devolt them into fifth place in the East. They host the Charlotte Hornets. And in the college game, a pair of ranked teams are in action tonight as ninth ranked Gonzaga plays number 16 St. Mary's in the finals of the West Coast Conference Tournament. And finally, for you hockey fans, the NHL has 10 games on, including one with the Tampa Bay Lightning, who've won the Eastern Conference three straight years, but are mired in a five-game losing streak. They host the Philadelphia Flyers. And that's it for your sports news today. Steph, back to you. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.